The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 precipitated a revolution. Secessionists feared that Lincoln's presidency would lead to the abolition of slavery. Within seven months of Lincoln's election, 11 states left the Union. In response to an attack on Fort Sumter, South Carolina, Lincoln called for a blockade of the 3,500-mile southern coastline. At the war's initial major engagement, the First Battle of Bull Run outside Washington, the Confederates routed the Federals. Bull Run showed that both armies required serious reorganization. The Union called on George McClellan, who, with great enthusiasm, whipped the northern regiments into shape. After much delay, McClellan began his drive against the Confederate capital at Richmond, sweeping up the Virginia Peninsula with a massive army. But Robert E. Lee unleashed his dazzling corps commander, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, in a daring campaign in the Shenandoah Valley. Jackson demoralized Union forces and threatened Washington. In the Seven Days Battles, Lee displayed his military genius, driving McClellan from the outskirts of Richmond. Then, Lee won a decisive victory at the Second Battle of Bull Run and invaded Maryland. In the West, rebel armies rolled into Kentucky, where Union forces staved off their advance at Perryville. On September 17, 1862, the bloodiest day of the Civil War, McClellan turned back Lee at Antietam Creek, Maryland. Although a tactical draw, Antietam gave Lincoln the political opportunity to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and thereby to endow the Union cause with a high moral purpose, the struggle to end slavery. Federal armies had better luck in the vast open spaces of the West. Gaining access to rivers leading directly into the South, Ulysses S. Grant captured two key forts, and in one of the bloodiest battles of the war, Shiloh, which cost 23,000 casualties, Grant held off a fierce southern assault. To man the southern offensive at Shiloh, the Confederacy left its largest city, New Orleans, undefended. By May, almost all of the vital Mississippi Valley fell to Union forces. At the Battle of Chancellorsville, in May, Lee fought his masterpiece. But Chancellorsville was a Pyrrhic victory. It cost the life of Stonewall Jackson. Without Jackson, Lee's bid for a victory on northern soil failed at Gettysburg. Meanwhile, Grant had tightened the noose around Vicksburg in a six-week siege. A day after Gettysburg, a whole Confederate army of 33,000 surrendered to Grant. Union control of the Mississippi split the Confederacy in two, and in November, federal forces scored dramatic victories in Tennessee, opening the South's heartland for an invasion in the spring. In March, Lincoln appointed Grant General-in-Chief of all Union armies. Grant considered the military problem to be simple. The capture of strategic cities and territory meant little. The armies of the South had to be destroyed. In May, Grant led 118,000 men into Virginia. Grant suffered a series of chilling reversals at Spotsylvania and at Cold Harbor, where he lost 7,000 men in a single hour. But Grant's sense of purpose never wavered. He kept punching at Lee, forcing him to pull back to a defense of Petersburg and Richmond. Meanwhile, Union forces under William Tecumseh Sherman stormed into Georgia. When John Hood ventured recklessly into Tennessee, where he'd hoped Sherman would chase him, Sherman chose to march unopposed to the sea. Hood's army was eventually wrecked as Sherman's troops cut a fiery swath through Georgia. In 1865, Sherman carried his war of terror north, while federal troops broke through at Petersburg. Lee evacuated Richmond, hoping to make a last-ditch effort by linking with the southern forces in North Carolina. But Grant quickly cut off Lee's escape, and Lee was forced to surrender. The number of soldiers who died in the Civil War nearly equals the total number of American deaths in all of the nation's wars combined. Yet with the Civil War came the triumph of an idea, that the United States was not just a cluster of member states, but a national state, a united